Today is uh, we're going to have just sort of a grab bag of things that um, I think should be in your brains over spring break while you ponder the glorious take home midterm, which you'll be getting at the end of class along with homework six solutions if you turned in homework six just now. Um, so among the grab bag of things that I wanted to talk about today is my favorite toy. And uh, it's, it's called the double pendulum. So um, there's lots of reasons why I think this is amazing. And you could basically have a whole class in physics, um, like a whole semester on the pendulum. We've talked about the single pendulum, right? We had two parameters, the forcing, that was a dial we had, and the damping. So the damping was you know, how much energy is being taken out, and it was proportional to the derivative of theta. Theta is one of the angles of the, the, just the main angle of, remember, so the single pendulum we had, the state variables were the angle, theta, and its rate of change, two degrees of freedom. And we wrote down a single equation, theta double dot equals some stuff. That was F equals MA for that problem. Um, really interesting behavior, right, that, that we saw. Lots of different things could happen, periodic behavior, chaotic behavior. OK, so we're adding some stuff here by putting on a second arm, right? So now there are four degrees of freedom. There's uh, two thetas and two theta dots. So if we wrote down the differential equations for the system, it would be you know, theta 1 double dot equals some stuff, theta 2 double dot equals some stuff, and they're coupled. And really interesting new behavior uh, happens here. Um, and so one, one of the interesting things about this is that uh, it's, it's sort of the great simple hallmark of a chaotic system because if I take the positions, the two thetas, and maybe I'll give them zero initial velocities. So, so I'm just going to let it go from here, for example. And I measure this state really well using lasers, let's say. And I identify its position to within 10 to the minus 4 meters or something like that. It's pretty good. And then I take the model, the theta double dot, theta 1 double dot, theta 2 double dot, that set of equations. And I tell it there'll be parameters like the mass and the length of the arms and things like this. And I plug all that stuff into the model, and I use you know, one of those crazy integrators we talked about that, you know, that we use for the solar system, where like, it's exact to double precision, and so there's no numerical error introduced by the integration of the equations. I can still only predict what it's going to do for about five seconds. And, and that's because of what you're going to see, is the exchange of energy between the two arms is a highly nonlinear process. It's kind of like when two round objects hit each other you know, the scattering that's going to happen is very sensitively dependent on the, their positions when that happens. And that's true here for the two arms and the energy exchange between them. OK, so let's let it go. The fact that it's making noise means it's losing energy. It's shaking the table a tiny bit. It's heating up the joints a little bit. There's no forcing aside from gravity at this point. It's still doing stuff. You think it's done with that bottom arm, but it's not. It's still going through. Oh, almost. OK, so eventually, you know, it settles down, and you know, it, it, um, all that dissipation, the friction takes over. And since there's no forcing, it ends up in that stable equilibrium point. Both thetas are 0. Yeah. But you know, imagine you know, the, the other problems we care about predicting the future state of are a lot more complex than this. And we can really only forecast what this is going to do for about five seconds. And so it's, it's remarkable in its simplicity. And then you know, there's other things, too, like there's other equilibrium points. We have this is a, uh, an equilibrium that you wouldn't really want to call it stable. The only reason I can get it there is that it's a little old. But if I came by and I tapped the table, it shouldn't stay there anymore. Small perturbation, it leaves. We know that means it's, it's either a saddle or an unstable point. That, that's a saddle. Because there are points that I could, you know, initial velocities where I could throw this thing, and it sort of all balances out, and it, you know, it lands right up here on its own. That's a one-dimensional curve in the two-dimensional state space of the thetas, though. So that's not likely to happen. Um, cool. So that's an equilibrium. This is also an equilibrium, which uh, also unstable. A saddle point, probably. Right? There are going to be states, initial velocities that I could throw it with that would let it sort of wander around for a while and then land like this, unlikely to be experimentally identified. So 
if I hit it, it'll leave, and you know, it'll eventually end up pointing straight down again. And there's a, there's a student in our research group who he's always able to get it to stand up on its head, and I'm never able to, so that's Tyler Gray. So, so he's really good at finding that manifold, and I am not. I think my fine motor skills are, are shot. So anyway, you could get it to stand up there. There's also initial velocities, right, that could get it to stand up on its head, and those are on the stable manifold of that saddle. Four variables, effectively, because the two thetas each have derivatives. So four-dimensional, uh, there's a manifold through that space that'll land there. And then there's, of course, you know, there's lots of fun other things. Like I could give it a really high initial velocity, and it might act like a gymnast for a while and look periodic for a while before this energy switching happens, and then it's an, a complete mess, and you're not, you, know, you wouldn't be able to tell. Anytime there's one of these exchanges of energy where the top arm is still, the bottom arm is whipping around, and then vice versa, that sort of thing happens. Um, you know, that's a, it's a very highly nonlinear uh, state of the system, and, and you know, that's, that's a situation where all of your forecasts would do completely different things. Um, so we'll do that one more time, the gymnast. And, you know, there are times when it spends, you know, I've seen it spend 15 or 20 seconds doing something that looks very periodic, um, even when it's got a lot of energy. There's all sorts of interesting things there. So, and oh, it'll act like a single pendulum, too, if the, the thetas get in line with each other, so that it sort of fell onto um, some low-dimensional path to, to looking linear again. Lots of cool stuff happening here. Thought I'd bring it in. We, at later in the semester, I'll give you a MATLAB code that integrates the equations of motion of this, and we'll kind of play around with it. Um, let's see, any questions about it? Uh, actually, since it's only four variables, it won't be crashing your computer all that bad. Yeah, yeah. Good question. Practical question. Other questions? Okay, field trip's over. You can go back to your seat. Thank you, everybody, for entertaining my favorite toy. Um, okay, we're going to try and finish chapter three. So we, we finished last time, I guess it was a week ago now, talking about we defined what a basin of attraction was. And we worked our way through a polar coordinate example and eventually got all the arrows pointing in a direction we agreed upon. Um, so one of the questions that you know, we haven't really addressed this much so far is, um, you know, when we're looking at the attracting state for an individual dynamical system, like, for example, this one, 2.7x times 1 minus x. You know, so far this semester we've been saying, all right, the points between 0 and 1, you know, they're in the basin of the sink, um, you know, near where the arrow is. Because all the ones we've iterated go there. We haven't really had any sort of higher level understanding of, of why there aren't other points in there that have some high period orbit that we just don't see because it's a source. We can, of course, plot F2 and see, oh, well, F2 doesn't actually have any other intersections with y equals x, so there can't be any period 2 orbits. Rock solid. We did not plot F17 and F345, and we didn't, we didn't do that and see, well, are there any intersections? And are, if so, are there sources at that spot? Um, so that's something that you know, we're, we're going to talk about today, a theorem, at least for a, some subset of these dynamical systems that helps us know when it is the case that we have um, some attracting state that is um, of low period and there's nothing else. I get this whole interval from 0 to 1 that all goes to that sink. And when we don't, right? So there's sometimes where there's no attra low dimensional attracting set. Sometimes there's some periodic window. And um, oh, that looks like... That's period five. Nice. Um, there's period three. Going to period six. This is never-ending fun. 
We also have said, all right, period three implies chaos, and we're going to try and understand that a little bit better today. You worked on it in your homework, but um, there's a few theorems that we're going to talk about today that, that help us understand these, these outcomes. Okay? So we need a, we need a, a, new, um, a new tool to understand this well. So I'm going to say, I'm going to define this new thing. We're going to let uh, F be a smooth map on R. We're going to say that the, the Schwarzian derivative of F is defined by sort of convoluted thing, s of f of x equals f triple prime of x divided by f prime of x minus 3 halves f double prime at x over f prime at x squared. Just making that up. <laughs> no, it is a thing. It's a thing from complex analysis that uh, you'll potentially learn about if you keep taking math classes. Um, and it's useful in this context because if we evaluate the functions that we care about and are trying to understand the basins of attraction of and stability of fixed points and what have you, um, the magnitude of this, and particularly whether it's negative or not, uh, will tell us something about the existence of sinks. And I have consequences when we talk about the Mandelbrot set and fractals after break. Okay, so that's the definition of it. And we say that F has a negative Schwarzian if it is the case that S is less than zero whenever F prime evaluated at X is not zero. F prime can't be zero um, everywhere else. If F prime is, if it is zero, obviously this is going to explode. So. Okay, this will work out okay. Um, all right, so let's think about our logistic map. So our logistic map, and, and we'll think about what S looks like for the logistic map. So we have this map that is G sub A of X equals AX times 1 minus X that we've been trying to understand through lots of different lenses. Um, That thing has a negative Schwarzian. Why? You don't normally do third derivatives in your head. But I bet you can do this one. I see some people nodding. Yes? Is it zero? Why is it zero? Because uh, g is of degree 2. Right, right. So if I take its first derivative, I get a line. If I take its second derivative, I get a constant. And if I take its third derivative, I get zero. OK. So if g, if I get back um, a zero here, and you know, at a half, obviously, it, it um, when x is a half, this is 0. But if I get 0 here, then um, that, and I have negative 3 halves, I don't need to evaluate this thing on the inside. It's being squared. I know this is going to be positive because of the square. No matter what the derivative or the second derivative of the logistic map is, you know, this is minus 3 halves times something that's squared. It could be 0, but it's going to be 
greater than or equal to zero. Um, we're not going to do a lot of sort of plugging in functions to see what this s looks like because it's uh, it's kind of a, a mess. But um, but this is so it's g always has a negative swatch in. Okay. And that's going to matter. So um, we'll write down a theorem that says why this is important. Um, so here's the theorem. If f has a negative Schwarzian, And if P is a fixed or periodic point of F, cool. So we have a fixed uh, or periodic point. In our picture here, we have three periodic points. P1 goes to P2, goes to P3. Um, OK, then either one of three things is going to be true. Number one, the basin the basin of attraction of P, which you know, for a sink, that's going to be some measure of stuff, an interval, perhaps that goes to P and for um, if it's a source, you know, there's a f some things that may land on it. Um, the basin of attraction of P contains an interval of infinite length. That's one of the things that can happen. So in our case here, um, you know, if the parameter is less than 3, I have a sink, and it doesn't have uh, an interval of infinite length as the basin, right? Because it's just 0 to 1, not including, that go to that point P, the sink. Uh, stuff outside of 0 to 1 goes to infinity. Yeah. So here's a map with a negative Schwarzian. P is a fixed point. That's that you know, negative slope, but slope smaller than one in magnitude. Um, but so the first thing that could happen, according to this theorem, is the basin of attraction of P contains an interval of infinite length. For example, you know, from zero to infinity, or from one to, from minus infinity to one, something like that. We have seen situations like that, but that's not true for our picture. So what else could happen? Uh, number two, there is a critical point. A critical point uh, C, such that F prime of C equals 0 in the basin of P. Huh. OK. So this is another thing that could happen. Is there a critical point, a place where F prime is 0 for this map? What is it? One half. It's the, any time you, no matter what your height is, no matter what this parameter is, I end up with a half being a, a critical point. It's a, the only place where the slope of this quadratic is zero. Cool. So that point, a half, uh, is in the basin of P. That's another thing that could happen. So far, we get these two things that could happen. C, a half, is in the basin of P. That's true for. Um, for, you know, for example, if I dial it down here, OK, so if I iterate a half, what happens to a half? It goes over to y equals x and then sort of spirals its way in because the slope's negative. Or if the slope, um, you know, if I'm smaller than 2, it spirals its way up, and a half actually would, would shoot to the left in that case and work its way in. OK, so that's another thing that could happen. Let's do, there's, there's one more thing before we get these on the board. We can't really argue about them until they're on the board. P is a source.
this is kind of cool. So we have some weird operator related to this, you know, slopes of our function, this Schwartzian thing, which we have no intuition for presently, except to say that we know that the logistic map has a negative Schwartzian because of it's a quadratic, and so will any quadratic. Um, cool. And we have these three things that could happen, if that's true. We have a fixed point P, uh, like 0 is a fixed point P. Negative Schwartzian, one of these three things is true. Either the basin of attraction of P contains an interval of infinite length, so that means minus infinity or plus infinity is one of the bounds of the basin, maybe both. Um, A linear map, by the way, with slope smaller than 1 would have an infinite basin, like a half x. That's a map. The origin is a sink, and minus infinity to infinity is in the basin of that sink. Cool? Negative Schwartzian because it's linear. Uh, there's a critical, so that's one thing that could happen. The critical point, there's a critical point, c, such that f prime of c is 0. Not true for linear maps, but for quadratic maps we have such a point. It's a half for this one. A half is a place where the derivative is 0. And this is, this is, number two is the, I don't know if you can tell now, but number two is the important thing here about deciding, for example, you know, when we see, you know, this period two sink here. And we're trying to decide, are there other sinks? What do you think? Given what's on the board right now, do you think there can be other sinks? What would another sink that isn't this period 2 orbit have to do, according to the theorem? Let's say I tell you there's a P3 and a P4. You, P, you know, they map back and forth to each other, and that's another sink. How can you tell me that's not possible? It would have to contain a point where the slope is 0. It would have to attract a critical point. How many of them are there? There's one. And what does it do? It goes to that. It goes to the, this square. Yeah, right. So assuming the theorem's true, we'll work our way through part of a proof of it, um, it's going to say that I don't actually have to know, I don't have to iterate lots and points and decide where they go. It, I just have to look at what a half does. Because a half is going to be attracted to the sink if there is one. If I go all the way out here to 4, what does a half do? A half maps to which maps to? Half maps to 1, which maps to 0, which is a source. So if I were to ask you, are there any sinks for the logistic map when the parameter is 4, before you came in today, you said no, and you probably would have given me lots of reasons. Here's another reason. There's no sinks when the parameter is 4, because if there were, it would have to that sink would have to attract a critical point, of which there is only one for the logistic map, a half, and a half is EP to 0. So this is a really powerful theorem with respect to deciding, you know, are there other attracting sets that we just don't see? Um, how many attracting sets can there be? If I'm counting them up, if I get a function with a negative Schwartzian, counting up the critical points, I may be able to use this to, to decide how many, how many different sinks there are. Uh, for example, let's see, we got one of these. Remember the first or second day of class we looked at this example? We had the crazy basins that were sort of like, so there's plus or minus root 5 is a period 2 orbit that bounds the basins of the two sinks at, yeah? Are there critical points here? Negative 1 and 1 are both sinks. And they're both critical points. So that's actually not all that fun. Because they are in the basins of those two sinks. The Schwartzian, we could probably work our way through what that looks like. Uh, the cubic term is going to survive, and it's going to have well, it's going to get multiplied by 3, and then it's going to be multiplied by 2, and still got the half out front. I think f triple prime is negative. Um, 
for positive x. No, it'll be a constant by then. Anyway, uh, so we'll, we'll be able to, I think on your homework, you're going to be doing some example functions of these. Um, but here we have two sinks, and each of them attracts a critical point. Uh, no basin of infinity example here. but OK, so, so this is a pretty interesting thing. We're going to try now to understand why this is true. And the second one is the sort of the second piece here is the interesting one with respect to you know deciding how many sinks there are given the number of critical points. So, so we're going to try and work our way through a sketch of a proof of this theorem. Um, and we're going to assume We're going to assume that P is neither a source nor a sink with an infinite basin. And we're going to show that uh, we're going to show that F prime of C equals 0 for some c in the basin of p. So we're sort of saying, all right, imagine we're in a situation where we have a negative Schwartzian. Uh, 1 and 3 aren't true. Let's show that 2 has to be true. That's not a proof of the whole theorem, but it's it's sort of gives you the the idea. Um, okay. So we're going to consider first. Uh, we're going to consider first the case where p is a fixed point. <laughs> p could be a periodic point, but it's harder to get intuition there. So we're going to start with p being fixed. And then we can imagine, you know, if it's a period 3 orbit, we can imagine that f3, things are happening with f3 with respect to p as a fixed point of f3. Um, OK. So p is a fixed point, And f prime of p is greater than or equal to 0. If it's a sink, uh, and it's going to attract this critical point C, we'll end up, you know, obviously with its slope being smaller than one. Also, um, but we're we're saying we're going to just imagine, for the sake of argument, we're thinking about a positive slope. The same thing would be true for um, for negative slopes. This will generalize to f prime negative and higher periods. Basically just have to flip our picture um, for, for negative slopes between minus 1 and 0. And, uh, and then for higher periods, we're going to be thinking about what it, the picture we end up drawing. We're going to be thinking about it as uh, f2 or f3 or whatever the periodic orbit number is. OK. So things that we know. Any questions right now? Yeah. Right here. Oh, OK. So you know, sinks, we have lots of sinks. Uh, and you know, the sinks got to have a slope between minus 1 and 1. And I'm saying, let's just focus on the situation where our slope is positive, not when it's negative, but it'll work. I'll just kind of flip my picture. And then for higher periods, you know, if I'm thinking about like a period 7 orbit, rather than looking at f and its period 7, I would think, oh, well, this is f7, and that's one of the points on that period 7 orbit. Yeah. Other questions? OK. Cool. So let's write down some things that we know. We have. 
We'll draw a picture in a minute too. That will be helpful. We have uh, f of p equals p because p is a fixed point. And we have that the slope at p is bigger than 0 and smaller than 1. Um, and in fact, I'm going to actually make it bigger than 0 because if it's exactly 0, then um, it's attracting itself, and that's and I'm done with the proof. So um, if f prime at p is 0, we're done. So let me just say it's, it's bigger than 0. Um, OK. And if it were bigger than 1, it would be a source. And I'm thinking about p as a, a sink attracting a critical point potentially here. p as a source is number 3. Cool. So I'm just imagining my slope is somewhere between 0 and 1. So I got, you know, at p where my function crosses, it's, I got a positive slope, but between 0 and 1. Um, OK. Good. Uh, OK, so things to write down. Note, we'll say that f prime at f prime at x cannot be constant in a neighborhood of p. Since that would imply that uh, f double prime and f triple prime are both 0, which would imply s was 0, this Schwarzian derivative, which has been erased, but it's got s triple prime and s double prime as numerators. So if there's no interesting stuff happening at the fixed point, if it's linear, um, f prime can't be a constant in the neighborhood of p, we would get this uh, a short scene of 0. OK, so we're thinking about curves, not lines here. Uh, cool, OK. Also, because you know, remember that the picture I just drew a second ago, we have this cone that we figured out in, in problem in the first homework set. This cone that's, you know, as long as the function stayed in between these two bounds, points in there are going to be in the basin of the sink at the origin in that case. Um, OK, f can't be simply monotonically increasing. Uh, within the crosshairs of this picture here, uh, because well, then what would happen if it if it did just simply monotonically increase and stay between those crosshairs? Um, and didn't leave. True. What would happen that would be difficult for our, given the assumptions we're making, in particular that one isn't true? I didn't draw one that was monotonically increasing, did I? So what would happen if I had a function that wasn't linear, but that was kind of wavy and was monotonically increasing like that forever? Oh, monotonically means it's always, you know, the slope is always positive or always negative if we're monotonically decreasing. Yeah. Or zero, slope can be zero too. Uh, what is the basin of attraction of the origin for the function I just drew? It's everything, right? Because if I leave the crosshairs, like let's say I go and cross through y equals x in either direction, that's another fixed point. Um, and if I don't do that and I stay within the cone forever, then the basin of attraction of my fixed point is 
you know, is everything from minus infinity to positive infinity. So I can't just do what I'm describing and end up, um, so there's, there may but not be a critical point for the function I just drew, right? It's, if its slope is never zero, for example, it's always positive. Okay. So if it were, if it simply monotonically increased within these hairs here, then you know I would get otherwise the basin is you know all of R. So it can't just be doing that. We're kind of working our way through you know why we're going to end up needing a critical point in the basin of P. Okay. So either F has a critical point, in the basin of P, and so this is a place where I have a local max or min or a slope of zero, um, or there exists an interval, uh, we'll call it A to B, in the basin of P. Um, and P lives in that interval between A and B, such that F prime of A is bigger than or equal to 1, and F prime of B is bigger than or equal to 1. And we're going to need a picture now to be able to see this. Maybe I'll draw my picture over here. Okay, so let's draw a picture. And I'll put my fixed point P right here in the middle. So P is my sink, and I'm trying to decide about its basin. Does the basin have infinity on one side or the other? Uh, is P a source? We're saying it's a sink. Or is there going to be a critical point that lives in the basin of P? All right, and I've decided, given some things here, that I can't, uh, I can't just have P monotonically increasing. It's, I've said positive slope here. Because then I would get an infinite basin. Um, so what that means is that there's going to be uh, either there's a critical point or there's this, this interval uh, between A and B. So we'll put A and B on here too. So let's put an A over here and a B over here. Uh, P lives between A and B. And it is the case that at A, the slope is bigger than or equal to 1. So that looks, I'm going to draw a function that has that the case. So it's bigger than 1 at A and bigger than 1 at B. So I'm going to try and draw something that, that, uh, that does this. So. Cool. So here's a function that has a sink at P. It has um, an interval between A and B. P lives in this interval where the slope at A is bigger than 1 and the slope at B is bigger than 1. Um, so I've drawn a function right here so far that satisfies this criteria, all the criteria that we've talked about. But I don't have a critical point yet. The function I just drew doesn't have this... Um, place where the slope is zero. So there's something wrong with the function I just drew. There's no critical point in there. Uh, did you have a question? That's what I did. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So y equals x, this is going to be a fixed point. This is y 
uh, is uh, negative x plus 2p, which is that other component of those crosshairs. Okay. Why does the slope have to be bigger than 1 somewhere? Well, otherwise, um, it's never, the crosshairs are never going to be left, right? If I never have a slope bigger than 1, you know, at both ends, then I'm, I'm going to stay between these crosshairs forever. I actually have to have a positive slope that could take me out and give me a, uh, it would give me a source over here if I crossed, or a source up there if I crossed, and I'd have a finite basin. P would have a finite basin as a sink, but in the, for the function I drew, it doesn't have a critical point. So there's something wrong with the function I drew. Um, so why, why, all right, so A uh, basin of P, P's in this basin, F at A and B are both bigger than or equal to 1, otherwise, um, F would remain within crosshairs forever. And I'd have an infinite basin. So I have to have, on both sides, because I'd get an infinite basin on either side, I have to have the slopes at A and B be bigger than 1, so that somewhere to the left and the right, I cross Y equals X again, and I have sources that bound my basin. All right, we're getting there. We still don't have uh, quite at our answer yet for why there's a critical point. And in fact, our function over there doesn't have one yet. So there's something wrong with it. It looks kind of like a cubic with a positive x cubed term right now. Um, OK. Since f prime at p is smaller than or equal to 1, so I have a sink there, and the interval from a to b exists, so this is like where are the, the places for which the slope is smaller than 1. Um, OK, cool. There is a local minimum, a local minimum m for f prime in the basin of p. This is an inflection point. An inflection point of f and a place where f double prime, we'll give it a name, um, m. OK, so f double prime at m is 0. f triple prime at m is going to be positive because the concavity is switching from down to up. So I'm going to call that point M, let's say it's like here. So I got a concave up function to the left of, or to the right of M, and I got a concave down function to the left of M. That has to happen if my slopes are going to go from bigger than 1 to smaller than 1 to bigger than 1 again. The concavity has to switch somewhere in between. There's an intermediate value theorem in here somewhere looking at the um, the derivative. OK. So that point is M. We're going to call that the concavity switching spot here. Um, OK. So let's look at what happens to this Schwartzian at M. S of F of M. So this is going to be F triple prime at M divided by F prime at M minus 3 halves. I don't know what f is, by the way, but we're just going to continue writing this down anyway. I'm wondering what the Schwartzian looks like here. All 
All right, so I've got a positive F triple prime. I've got a positive F prime. My F double prime is 0 at M. OK, that's a big deal. The numerator is 0. At, a, at one of these points that of the, where the concavity changes. Numerator is 0 here. So that means the negative term, the thing you know, that's being squared on the inside, is 0. Minus 3 halves copies of 0 is 0. So I'm just left with this. So is F triple prime positive? It is. Your, your instinct for F triple prime is probably not great. Mine is not either. I don't often look at it. But it's written on the board that F triple prime is positive because that's what happens when you switch concavity from down to up. We also have F prime, and that's a positive because our function is going up. So these are two positive numbers, which means S is bigger than 0. Which, according to the theorem, isn't supposed to happen. I'm supposed to be starting with a function with a negative Schwarzian. So this is bad. So there's something wrong with my function. Cool. Um, we know our function, we have a negative Schwarzian. M in particular. And that means that um, F prime at M has to be negative. It's not in my picture. But for, so in the picture that I drew, the, the function that I drew, the Schwarzian at M is positive. I need to draw another function where now, I know this is positive according to the concavity switch, F prime at M. Um, so the fact that we have a negative Schwarzian at M, this implies that F prime at M is negative in order to make this leading term positive over negative, this leading term negative because this is 0. OK, so we're going to draw another picture then. We're going to go to key lime because it's spring break coming up. So here's our other picture then. We have to have a negative slope at M. Uh, and M is where the concavity changes from down to up. Yeah? OK. Things are happening. So here we go. Concavity switches from down to up at M. Now f prime at m is what? I'm just going to draw this little dash line here at m just so we see what's going on. I wanted the slope at m to be uh, negative instead of positive in order to make my Schwarzian negative. And in doing so, I've created some stuff. Yeah? What have I created? I've created, it looks like in this case I created two, but in particular I created that one right there. There has to be a critical point C now to the left of M because in order to get the concavity switch to happen in the right place, um, I needed to create this point C, which is now in the basin of P. There's another critical point down here that I just made, which means there might be a period 2 sink somewhere. My goodness, ignore that for now. Um, so, so we'll just write down what we figured out. F prime at M is negative. Okay, that's a requirement to make this Schwarzian negative. So then the intermediate value theorem says we have a critical point which we called C. Uh, between P and M. Why? Well, the slope's positive at P and the slope's negative at M. So there has to be a spot between P and M where the slope is 0. That's the point C. And C is going to be in the basin of P. Uh, right. So. All right, so, it has to, so the critical point C between P and M such that 
f prime at c is 0. So it's a critical point. Cool. So we said, all right, imagine that you know we have p, the infinite. We don't, we're not in situation 1 where the basin of p is an interval of infinite length. p is not a source. So that means if the theorem's right, this has to be true. And so we worked our way through um, showing. We tried to draw a function for which it wasn't true, and it didn't work. That was the brown one. It had a Schwarzian of 0 at m, um, and it needed to be negative. All right, so this function is not, I don't know what the equation is for this thing here. But going back to the logistic map, we only have a single critical point for the logistic map. It has to be attracted to the sink between 0 and 1. There can't be two because there's only one critical point to be attracted to it because the Schwarzian is negative everywhere. Um, OK, so the, the, this is the big consequence. We'll go back to key lime for the big consequence here. Since x equals a half is the only critical point of my logistic map g sub a, because it's a quadratic, there's only one of these places where the slope's 0, um, there can only be one sink. There can only be one. After break, we're going to see some more consequences of this for the Mandelbrot set. It's pretty cool. But if you're trying to decide, are, you know, what, are these, what is the attracting state? What, you know, what is possible? Actually, now, all you have to do is find the critical point. If it, let's say it's a quadratic map. All you got to do is find the critical point and see where it goes. If it goes to something that's not a sink, there's no sink. That's pretty cool. Questions? OK, so you know, we're iterating 0 0.1 and 0 0.2 in, these, you know, in this animation here. But you could just iterate a half and see where it goes. If it doesn't go to a sink, there isn't one. I think that's pretty cool. Questions? Yeah. So for creating the bifurcation diagram, um, would it have been sort of easier to just have our initial condition always be one half because that'll always go to the sink instead of doing instead of doing random uh, random initial conditions? Yeah. The question is, you know, why don't we just iterate a half as the initial condition, and that would work just fine. Um, you, I think you learn a little bit more by having the initial condition be random and then realizing, wow, I could start with anything and I still get the same picture. You would also get this picture if you started with a half. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Well, let's see. Oh, I should say, there's one caveat. Uh, when the parameter is 4, if I started with a half, what would happen? I would end up at 0. I wouldn't get that full, you know, uniform looking density thing. Um, but yes, good idea. Other questions? OK, a couple more things, uh, finishing up chapter 3 here. So, so this is kind of fun. There's a, uh, there's a theorem at the end of chapter 3 called Sharkovsky's theorem that we'll write down. Okay, so this is like the, the challenge section at the end of chapter 3. We'll learn more about this later, but um, sh you'll spend time working on this after break on thinking about why this is true. Sharkovsky's theorem. And this is about, uh, this is about what periodic orbits exist given that you, you, know, you see the transition graph and you know, like for example, we know the logistic map transition graph is fully connected and now you have an appreciation for why that means every period is possible. You also know that even simpler maps, like on home, question four of your homework, where the transition graph isn't completely connected, but as long as 
there's a self loop, then a period three orbit exists. Wow, that means that I can get to any period. That's crazy. So the question then is, given an integer period, what other periods are possible, are known to be true, just, the, just because you know the existence of that one? So if period three implies everything, period two doesn't. In fact, period two orbits, the existence of one, that only implies one thing, and that is the existence of a period one fixed point. Does it? Is there a fixed point? If there's a period two orbit? The arrows just go from one goes to L to R and one goes from R to L. Right. And yeah, yeah. The transition graph, yeah. So for continuous maps. Okay. The only way that that's gonna happen is if there's a fixed point. So this would be like one um, there would need to be another loop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so you know, this is to get our intuition together for this, here's here's a picture to I mean, it's a complicated one, but so this is, we don't know what the function is, uh, and we're thinking about, um, we're thinking about eight partitions of some interval, a partition of an interval into eight pieces, eight disjoint pieces, overlapping at the boundaries, and this is the transition graph. So A maps to itself means F of A, or A1, F of A1 covers A1. So that's a self-loop, which means there's a fixed point, right, if I can write A1 twice in a row. Okay. Can somebody tell me what a period two orbit would look like here? Scott? Would it have to be A8, A7? A8, A7, and then back to A8. OK, that tells me there's a period two orbit. Is there a period three orbit up here? Is there a way to write three letters and then the same three letters again forever? There isn't. What about four? OK, where's 4? Somebody tell me what that is. A5, A6, A7, A8, A5. OK, so that could, what about period 6? A3, 4, 5, OK, cool. What about 5? Is there a period 5 over it? No. So the caption says, the existence of periods 1, 2, 4, 6, and 8. OK, so that, that's shown by this. And all numbers greater than 9. Why can I do all numbers greater than 9? Yeah? you can have some number of um, A1s and then go over That's right, yeah. I could, do, I could do A1 any number of times that I want before going all the way around. If I just stated A1, then I would do, um, that would be a period, that, that would be just the, peri the fixed point, yeah? Okay, so there's some implication here about periodic orbits and what they mean about existence of other periodic orbits. And we know the, the big one we talked about is period three. Okay, that implies everything. So there's an, or there's an explicit ordering here. Um, this is Tchaikovsky's ordering of these integers. So it's, it starts with three because three implies everything. Period three implies every period. And instead of, this is supposed to be some sort of, it's not um, the less than sign, it's kind of a squiggly version of it. Three implies five, which implies seven, which implies nine. Um, and we're going to keep going. We end up skipping up to 6, which implies 10, which implies uh, 2 times 5 is 10, which implies uh, dot, dot, dot. We have 2 to the 2 times 3, and 2 to the 2 times 5, and so on. So that we end up with putting powers of 2 in front of this sequence of odd numbers. Okay, so this goes, if I keep going, 2 to the 3 times 3, 2 to the 3 times 5, 2 to the 4, and then all the way down we'll end up with um, 2 to the 3, 2 to the 2, 2 to the 1, and 1. So a fixed point is the last thing here, and it implies nothing. It doesn't imply the existence of any other periods for continuous maps. Um, uh, period two orbit does imply the existence of a fixed point. So if I think about what a period two orbit looks like, usually we end up with uh, you know, some kind of square. And a function, if I'm going to have this square, the function that sits on top of it is going to need to go through that corner and that corner. And it's got to be a continuous function. 
Yeah. So whatever it's doing, um, you know, I can have something that looks like the logistic map, or I can have some other weird thing. But the, if a function is going to have, it's going to cross between here and here. If the function is going to be drawn between those two spots to create the square, I'm not going to be able to do it without crossing y equals x. So I'm going to create a fixed point when I do that. Um, OK. So the, it could be a source or a sink, depending on the slope when it goes through y equals x. But that's the only way I can get a curve to cross, uh, to touch both of these spots, is to go through y equals x. So two, that's why 2 implies 1. And if you're thinking, all right, well, what about why does 4 imply 2? Imagine that my, you know, my two points here are fixed points of f4 um, instead of f2. Let me say that again. So imagine, so if this is, imagine this is uh, f. And the existence of this period 2 orbit implies a fixed point. We're going to do the same thing, but consider the brown curve to be f2. So if f2 has a period 2 orbit here and here that's not, that aren't also fixed points of, if f2 has a period, if f2 has a period 2 orbit that is not a period 2 orbit of f, then those are on a period 4 orbit. And this crossing is one of the period two orbits of f. So 4 implies 2, and so on. So this is kind of nuts. Um, but it gets at this idea. I mean, we skipped kind of all the way to the very last implication, which is that period 3 implies every integer period. Um, but here we had period 9 being possible. That's the first odd period we had available to us other than 1. And and it implied every other period. The existence of period 9 implied every other period. It did not imply 3, 5, or 7. 3, 5, and 7 are not available to us in this transition graph. OK, so later in the semester, you're going to be kind of playing around with why this looks the way it does. Like, what is it about the stretching implied here that the stretching of an interval that, that creates this particular sequence? You can read about it now if you want. Yeah. What is, um, how does it continue the, uh, the ellipses? It goes uh, 2 times 5 to what? Is that the 2 times 7? Yes. And then just the odds or? Yeah, odd numbers. Okay. Yeah. Not clear. 2 times, yeah, 2 times 7, 2 times 9, 2 squared times 3, 5, 7, 9. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 OK. Uh, anything else I want to say about this? I suppose I should just write the theorem down. That would be good. So if we assume f is a, continu and a continuous map on an interval, and has a period p orbit. If p fake less than sign squiggly is less than q, then f has a period q orbit. No, it's not an implication. So it's just, this is just an ordering of the natural numbers. And if I put less thans exactly less than, you know, just the regular less than signs up here, it would look like I don't understand math. So we're, I'm saying that you should make them a little different. Like in the, I think uh, it's Sharkovsky's ordering of the naturals. So they look like that. Easier in LaTeX. Everything's easier in LaTeX, right? Definitely not. Okay, so so that's it for that's it for Sharkovsky's theorem. I think um, I think what I'm going to do is stop now then and and talk about the midterm. Okay, so I'm going to hand out a midterm exam, which we can pass around here.
This is due when you come back to class on Tuesday. If you turned in homework six, then, uh, then you can take one of the solutions to homework six, also going around the room. If you didn't, and let's say you're going to turn it in to tonight, tomorrow, you're going to email it to me, then when you do, I will send you the solutions to homework six, but you should skip them as they go by you. Uh, okay, so as you get the midterm exam, you're going to notice a few things. Uh, one is that there are eight questions, and the first five of them are true-false questions. This is a math class, and in math classes, you're often asked true-false questions. It hasn't really happened this semester so far until now. So the, the way that works is uh, if you think that the answer is true, you need to prove it, as opposed to, say, showing me a set of three of your favorite examples that it's true. That's fine, too, but you also need to prove that it's true. And then uh, if it's false, if you think it's false, and you're going to demonstrate that to me, actually, just one example is enough. So that's kind of nice. Um, this being an exam, you're not going to get feedback from me as to whether or not the true, you know, your answer to the true-false question is correct until it's graded. So uh, usually what happens here is that if you say it's true and it's false, but you do an awesome job describing why you think it's true, you're eligible for partial credit, but probably not more than a third of the points on that question. Or if it's false, uh, or it's true and you say it's false and you do an amazing job describing your counterexample and it's just wrong, you're eligible for a third of the points of partial credit for that. Um, but the determination is important. And I will often find people doing the whole T hybrid F thing where they don't, you know, like that, or they actually don't answer whether they think it's true or false. They just write a bunch of stuff. You need to say up front, like the first word of your answer should be either true or false, and then say the rest of the stuff. Um, OK, so that's the first five questions. And then the next three questions are more sort of workmanlike, you know, you're going to make one of the periodic table type things, or you're going to find a periodic orbit and figure out what its stability is, um, which you all have seen many examples of. And you've also seen examples of, of proofs in the solutions to these homework sets, too. So, uh, OK, is there any, any questions? Yeah. What do you mean by a single interval? OK. There's a question about the first one, and I say uh, a single interval. I mean something like A to B, like we talked about here. Um, I don't mean the intervals, for example, of that the first that cubic we talked about, where there are a bunch of them next to each other. Yeah. Other questions? That's because that's not a single one. Do we have any general questions about stuff like that? Yes. Or yeah, you could tweet the questions or you could email me the questions. And if I think they're good enough to warrant responses, I'll tell everybody. You shouldn't communicate with each other about the exam. Uh, but yeah, I, if I think somebody's got a good enough question to answer, I'll, I'll tell everybody, not just the person who asked it. Other questions? OK, so um, that's great. On your way out, please pick up your homeworks if they're over there. Homework 5 and solutions are over there.